Chapter Seventeen of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouchette Carey, like ships that pass in the night. The situation that has not its duty, its ideal, was never yet occupied by man. Yes, here in this miserable, despicable actual wherein thou even now standest, here or nowhere is thy ideal. Work it out, therefore. The ideal is in thyself. The impediment, too, is in thyself. Carlyle. Something there was in her life incomplete, imperfect, unfinished. Longfellow. One evening, about a week later, Thorold Chater walked quickly over the Dereham Bridge on his way from the station. His day, as usual, had been spent in his dingy chambers in Lincoln's Inn. He had worked hard and felt unusually weary, and the damp chilliness of the mists rising from the river made him shiver and button up his coat more closely. A slight mizzling rain was now falling. The pavements were wet and greasy. The gas lights on the towing path seemed to waver and then flare up with windy flickers. The black hulls of the boats and barges moored to the shore loomed through the mist like vast monsters weltering in the mud. And the grey river flowing under the bridges washed silently against the piers in the darkness. Mr. Chater's chambers in Lincoln's Inn were high up, and very small and inconvenient. Chater's sky parlour, some of his friends called it, for in reality it consisted of only one room and a good-sized cupboard but the view of chimney-pots from the window was certainly unique. To be sure, it was somewhat cold in winter, and at times the chimney was given to smoking, and in summer it certainly resembled the black hole in Calcutta, for these were trifles to be borne stoically, if not cheerfully. In this den Thorold Chater did most of his literary work, and waited for briefs, nor did he wait wholly in vain. Althea had spoken of him as a poor man, and this opinion was shared by many others, when all friends of the family who had visited at the old manor house came down to the dull, shabby-looking house in High Street where Thorold and his sister lived, they used to sigh and shrug their shoulders. It was grievous, they would say. No wonder poor Joanna looked so old and careworn, and they only kept one servant, too. And then they would talk, under their breath, of the wasteful extravagance of the old manor house and then of that racing establishment at Newmarket, to which the tage of fortunes had been sacrificed. But if Thorold and Joanna practised rigid economy, and only kept one servant, it was because they stinted themselves of their own free will. Thorold Chater was not really poor. His literary work was successful, and his papers on social questions were so brilliant and versatile, so teeming with thoughts and sparkles of wit, that he was already making his mark as a clever writer and in his own profession he was not doing so badly. Quite recently he had distinguished himself in some case. Chater is a clear-headed lawyer. He is sharp and has plenty of brains, his friends would say. He will get on right enough if he does not kill himself with work first. Thorold loved his work. The hours spent in that grimy den were full of enjoyment to him. He was equally happy solving some legal problem or doing some of his journalistic work. His clear, strong brains delighted in labour. He had one curious companion of his solitude, a small yellow cat who had only three legs, whom he had rescued from a violent death and who refused to leave him. Cicero was not an attractive animal, but his heart was in the right place. He adored his master, and when Thorold's steps sounded on the stairs in the morning, Cicero would jump off the old coat on the shelf where he was accustomed to pass the night and limp with loud purrs to the door. Cicero was as much a hermit as his master. He took his exercise among the chimney-pots and never went downstairs, where unseen enemies lurked unnumbered for him. He had his pennyworth of milk, and his skewer of cat's meat, and a share of his master's frugal luncheon. And on Sundays, the fat old housekeeper toiled up the stairs and deposited the rations for the day, grumbling as she did so. But although Thorold already earned a fair income, he lived as though he were poor, and both he and his sister were almost parsimonious in their habits. But not even Althea, who was their closest friend, did more than guess at the reason for all this thrift. Thorold had set himself an Herculean task, to pay his father's debts, 
and in this Joanna had willingly helped him. With all her faults and failings, she was a good woman, and her sense of honour was almost as strong as his. Thorold was still at Oxford when his father died. His brother Tristram was three or four years older. He had been summoned in haste to the deathbed, but to his relief, his father recognised him. It is a bad business, my boy, he said faintly, as Thorold took his hand. If I could only have my life again, I would do differently. And a few minutes later, when they thought he was sleeping, he opened his eyes. Never get into debt, Trist, he murmured. It is hard for a man to die peacefully with a millstone round his neck. And Thorold was struck by the look of anguish that crossed his face. Father, he said gently, for he was young and impressionable, and perhaps in his wish to give comfort, he hardly knew what he was saying. Father, you shall die in peace, and Trist and I will work hard and pay your debts. Yes, yes, murmured Tristram with a sob. We will pay them debt. Then a wonderful smile came over the sick man's face. Good lads, good lads, he muttered. God bless you both. Those were his last words, but even as he lay in his coffin, Thorold began to realize that the millstone was already round his own neck. Those first years that followed his father's death were very sad ones to Thorold. His mother's failing health and Joanna's disappointment embittered the peace of their home, and worse than all, Tristram became a care to them. He had been brought up in expectation of a fortune, and as far as work was concerned, his life at the university had been a failure. "'What does it matter whether I grind or not?' he would say. "'I am having a good old time, and the governor will pay my debts.' And when the evil days came, and George Sage's son had to put their shoulders to the wheel and earn their bread, there seemed nothing that Tristram could do. Again and again a berth had been found for him, but he had failed to keep it. Either he had been wanting in steadiness or application, or he had lost his temper and quarrelled with his employer. He is not worth his salt, one of them said angrily to Thorold. In sheer desperation, Thorold went to an old cousin who had already shown him a great deal of kindness, and with his help Tristram was equipped and shipped off to New Zealand. Perhaps he will do better in a new world, Thorold said, when Joanna bewailed his departure rather bitterly. Tristram was her darling. She loved him far better than she did Thorold. Like many other prodigals, Tristram Chater was not without his endearing qualities. Women loved him, and he was good to them but in character he was selfish and unstable as water, and very prone to fall into temptation. Already, as Thorold knew, he had become addicted to low pleasures. His friends were worthless and dissipated, but Joanna, who was mildly obstinate on occasion, turned a deaf ear to all Thorold's hints on this subject. Tristram seemed to the better for a time in his new environment. Then he foolishly married some pretty, penniless girl who took his fancy, and after that they lost sight of him. Thorold was thinking of him now as he walked over the wet bridge. Although he was a ne'er do well, he was his only brother, and in the old days they had been close chums and playfellows. Dear old Trist, he said to himself, I wonder what he is doing now, and if Ella makes him a good wife. And then, in the darkness, Tristram's handsome face and tender, humorous smile seemed to rise vividly before him. He could even hear his voice, clear and boyish, close to his ear. Well played, old chappy, but it was a fluke for all that. What on earth makes me think of Trist tonight? Thorold asked himself in some perplexity. But if he had only guessed the truth, he need not have puzzled himself. At that very moment, under the flickering wind-blown gaslight, the brothers had passed each other without recognition, like ships that pass in the night. Thorold was trying to keep his umbrella steady, and took no notice of the passenger, who almost brushed his elbow, though he heard a small childish voice say, I don't like English rain, father, but the answer did not reach him. Aye, it is a bit saft bit, as the Scotch folk say. Creep under my Inverness cape, little one, and it'll keep you dry. And then the little feet toiled on wearily and bravely in the darkness. As Thorold let himself in with his latch key, the parlour door was opened hastily, and a woman's face peeped out anxiously. Is that you, Thorold? Then the man bit his lip with sudden irritation. 
Day after day, month after month, this was Joanna's never varying formula. Until, is that you, Thorold? seemed to be dinned into his brain like a monotonous sing-song. Who should it be? he longed to answer this evening. What other fellow do you suppose would let himself in with my latchkey? But he controlled himself. Joanna had no sense of humour, and did not understand sarcasm. Yes, here I am, as large as life, he returned cheerfully. But don't touch me, dear, for I am trifle wet. Is supper ready? I will just change my coat and be with you in a moment. Ah, Rabat Lakum, as a big grey Persian cat rubbed against his legs. So you are there, old mother of all the cats, and you are coming up with me, eh? Don't forget to rub your feet, Thorold. There were marks on the landing carpet yesterday, and then Joanna went back to pick up her knitting, feeling that she had properly welcomed her brother. Joanna Chaita had been a pretty girl, with that soft, rounded prettiness that belongs to youth. But at six and thirty she was faded and old maidish. Doreen and Althea, who were several years older, scarcely looked their age, but Joanna had worn badly. Disappointment and sorrow, and the small, carking cares of daily life, had washed away the pretty bloom from her cheeks, and had sharpened the lines of her face. Her brown hair was streaked with grey, and though her figure was still graceful and she dressed youthfully, strangers always thought she was at least four to five. Women are as old as they feel, people say, but in that case Joanna would have been seventy at least. To her, the drama of life had been wholly tragical. She had lost her father and the mother she adored, and the beloved home of her childhood. The man to whom she had given her young affections, and whom she looked upon as her future husband, had basely deserted her in her adversity. And as though this were not enough, her favourite brother was in exile, separated from her by the weary ocean. If Joanna had married Leslie Parker, she would have made an excellent wife and mother, but her present environment did not suit her. She grew thin and weedy, as Althea once phrased it. Joanna was not a clever woman. She was dense and emotional, and her mild obstinacy and tenacity were powerful factors in her daily life. She had long ago shelved her deeper griefs, but a never-ending crop of minor worries furnished her with topics of conversation. Thorold was fond of his sister, but she was no companion to him. His calm, self-restrained nature was the very antipodes of Joanna's fretful and nervous temperament. Manlike, he failed to understand why the dust and sweepings of the day should be brought for his inspection. Joanna had not toiled long hours in hard, strenuous brain labor, in a grimy attic with a three-legged Cicera curled up at her feet. Her work had been light compared to his. Sometimes, when he felt lonely and weary, and the need for companionship was unusually strong, he would try and interest her in his day's work, but it was always a failure. She would listen, and then her attention would fly off at a tangent, or he would see her trying to stifle a yawn. There was something he wanted to tell her this evening, for the day had been eventful to him. If Althea had been his sister, he would have followed her into the sitting room, wet as he was, and would have told her triumphantly that his foot was on the rung of the ladder at last, and that he had begun to climb in earnest. And he would have told her, too, that before long their father's debts would be all cleared off. Thorold had not done this unaided. About eighteen months before, the old cousin who had come to his assistance with Tristram died, and with the exception of five hundred pounds to Joanna, left all his savings, amounting to several thousands, to Thorold. Thorold never consulted anyone. He asked no advice. He paid in twelve hundred pounds at his bankers, that it might be ready for a rainy day, and then he went around to his father's creditors, paying off each one by turn. The racing debts had been settled years ago, in his father's lifetime, by the sale of the old manor house and the lands adjoining. But he had lived recklessly, and his creditors were many. He owed large sums to a carriage builder in Baker Street, and to his tailor, wine merchant, and other tradespeople. One of them, a small jobbing carpenter who lived in the village, stared incredulously at the cheque in his hand and then fairly burst out crying. "'It is for joy, Mr. Thorold,' cried the poor fellow, rubbing his coat sleeve across his eyes. "'For I never expected to see a penny of the squire's money, and we have had hard times lately. Business has been slack, and my missus has been poorly and run up a doctor's bill, and God bless you, sir, for your honest dealing with a poor man.' for I shall be able to keep the shop together now. And for that afternoon at least, Thorold felt a lightening. 
of the millstone round his neck. Joanna looked at him a little tearfully when he showed her the receipted bills. She was not too dense to understand the grandeur of the action. How few men would have considered themselves bound by a few impulsive words gasped out by a deathbed. "'You have used all Cousin Rupert's money in paying father's debts,' she said, and there was a queer look in her eyes. "'No, dear,' he returned gently. "'I have not spent it all. I am keeping twelve hundred pounds for a rainy day. I thought that would be only right. But, Joe, there are only two bills left, and most of the things owing were for Tristram.' Tristram, in a startled voice, are you sure of that? Yes, things that he wanted at Oxford and that father ordered, but three or four hundred would clear off the whole account. Thorold, returned his sister plaintively, and now she was actually crying. You do not expect me to help with my money. No, of course not. What an idea, he replied hastily. But all the same he felt vaguely surprised. All these years Joanna had stinted herself of comforts had scraped and saved and pared down every unnecessary expense with ungrudging cheerfulness, and with all her grumblings and worries she had never said one word of blame on this score, and now she was hugging her small fortune almost jealously. "'I am very sorry, dear, but I cannot give you my money,' she went on quickly. "'It is my own money, you know. Dear Cousin Rupert left it to me. I have helped you as well as I could all these years, but I must keep this for my very own.' "'Of course you shall keep it,' returned her brother, for Joanna was growing quite excited. "'I suppose you will put it into the London and County Bank?' "'Yes, that will be the best, and then I can get it out easily. "'The consoles will be better, perhaps,' he continued musingly, "'and you would get more interest, or you might buy some of those shares that Doreen was mentioning.' "'No, no, I prefer the London and County,' returned Joanna obstinately. "'Let me do what I like with my own money.' "'And Thorold said no more.' but now and then he wondered if Joanna had drawn on her secret hoard. As far as he could see, she had bought nothing fresh for the house, and certainly not for her dress during the last eighteen months, and their bill of fare was not more luxurious. End of chapter 17「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」The house in High Street where the Chaytors lived was somewhat dingy and uninviting in its outward aspect, but inside it was not without its advantages. A small paved court separated it from the street, and at night its front windows were illuminated by the flaring gaslights from the opposite shops. All day long the ceaseless patter of foot passengers on the pavement and the rumble and rattle of cabs, omnibuses and carts made the narrow windows shake in their frames. And it was far into the night before silence brooded over the old town. On one side of the passage was a small room where Thorold kept a good many of his books and papers. It was called a study, but he never sat there. Joanna had long ago proved to him that with one servant and a limited purse, an extra fire would be quite sinful extravagance. It was for this reason, too, that she so seldom used her drawing room. It was a pretty room on the first floor, with a pleasant view of the garden, and in the summer she liked to sit at the open window with her work, and watch Thorold digging and raking in the borders. Gardening was his favorite amusement, and he took great pride in his flower beds. Sometimes, when she had leisure, Joanna would weed or water a little, but she always made much of these labors. The room they mostly used was a large one on the ground floor. It extended from the front to the back of the house. And the two narrow windows at the farther end overlooked the shady old garden. This part of the room was furnished as a study. The stained bookshelves were loaded with ponderous looking books. A writing table occupied one window and two comfortable easy chairs, and Joanna's overflowing work basket stood on either side of the fireplace. A bookstand and a reading lamp were by Thorold's chair, 
the front portion of the room was used for their meals. When Thorold came down that evening, the room looked warm and cosy. The crimson curtains were drawn, and a bright fire blazed cheerfully. The supper was laid, and Jemima had just brought it in a small covered dish and placed it before her mistress. Thorold was hungry, for his luncheon had been a light one. For a wonder, the chops were well cooked and hot, and as he helped himself to the nicely browned mashed potatoes, he felt disposed to enjoy himself. He would tell Joanna about his visit to Murdoch and Williams. She would be interested, and for once they would have a sociable evening. He even thought that he would ask for a cup of coffee, as he felt chilled and tired, and then, by way of making himself pleasant, he commended Jemima's cookery. It was an unfortunate choice of subjects. Joanna, who had been tranquilly eating her supper, suddenly grew red and querulous. "'Ah, she can cook well enough if she chooses,' she returned. "'But there, she so seldom chooses to take pains. "'Thorold, I shall have to part with that girl. "'Her wastefulness and extravagance are beyond everything. "'And then she is so self-willed, too. "'She will not mind anything I tell her. "'Again and again I have begged her not to put an egg in the rice pudding, "'but she does it all the same.' "'I suppose she thinks the egg will make the pudding nicer,' returned Thorold mildly. "'And then, to change the subject,' he said boldly, "'I have rather a headache this evening, dear. "'Do you think Jemima could make me a cup of coffee?' "'She could make it, but I doubt if you would care to drink it,' she returned fretfully. "'And if she wants to go out, too. "'She has got a young man, I know she has. "'I taxed her with it this very morning, and she was as impertinent as possible.' "'My dear Joa, for his sense of fairness was roused by this. Why should not the poor girl have a lover? She is very good-looking, and as long as she conducts herself properly, I can see no objection to the young man. Yes, and she will be having him in and giving him supper when we are out. Not that I ever do go out, heaven knows. I declare I quite envy you, Thorold, going out every morning to your work. Women's lives are far more dull and monotonous than men's. Here Joanna's voice works more plaintive than ever. It was naturally rather a sweet voice, but fretfulness and discontent had deadened the harmony. If, as they say, the closing of an eyelid will shut out the lustre of a planet, so to Joanna the small everyday worries seemed to obliterate the larger and grander interests of life. Jemima's good looks, her lover, her small impertinences and misdemeanors, loomed like gigantic shadows on her horizon. If she could only learn the right proportion of things— Thorold had said once to Althea, almost in despair. When Joanna made her dolorous little speech, Thorold raised his eyes from his plate and looked at her. "'Why do you not go to the Red House oftener?' he asked gravely. "'You know how glad they will be to have you. You stay at home too much, Joa, but it is your own fault, you know. Doreen and Althea are always sending you invitations.' "'Yes, I know, and I am very fond of Althea.' But somehow I never care to go to the Red House. It reminds me too much of the dear old manor house. That room of Althea's makes me quite shiver when I enter it. Oh, I would not give way to those feelings, Joba, he returned hastily. In life one has to harden oneself to all sorts of things, and it is no use moping and brooding over troubles that cannot be altered. If Jemima wants to go out, perhaps we had better not wait any longer. And then he lighted his reading lamp and unfolded his paper. In spite of the well-cooked chops, supper has certainly not been more festive than usual. And then a strange fancy came to Thorold. How would it be with him if some younger, brighter face were to be opposite to him, evening after evening? Would not his home, humble as it was, be a very different place? He knew why he was happier in his chambers at Lincoln's Inn. To his reserved temperament, solitude was far preferable than the uncongenial fellowship with this small human soul this weary little pilgrim forever carrying her heavy pack of worries. Poor dear Joa, he said to himself, for his keen eyes had noticed the reddened eyelids. Very likely she remembers that it is Tristram's birthday, and that he is thirty-eight today. Jemima had cleared the table and vanished. He was still alone, and Rabat Lacoum was curled up like a huge grey ball at his feet. The leading article was unusually clever, and absorbed him until a sudden fragrance pervaded the room, and there stood Joanna at his elbow with a steaming cup of coffee. I waited until Jemima went out, and then I made it myself. It is very strong coffee, Thorold, and it will do your head good. 
Joanna's voice was a little more cheerful as she said this, and the slight flush from her exertions made her look younger. Thorold was quite touched. He put out his hand and patted his sister's arm caressingly. How good of you to take so much trouble, my dear. I never thought of the coffee again. Sit down, Joe, and let us be comfortable. I have been wanting to tell you something all the evening. Have you indeed? And Joanna brightened. Wait a moment, I want to wind some wool. I can hear you talk all the same. And yet I must mention one thing before you begin. The gas man called for his account, and you forgot to leave the cheque. Did I? I was in a hurry, but I will write it before I go to bed. Thank you. And there is one other thing, Thorold. If Jemima goes at her month, as she threatens, will she not forfeit her wages? You are a lawyer, so you ought to know. I am quite sure Jemima means to do nothing of the kind, he returned impatiently. Look here, Joe. She is the best servant we have had yet, and I would rather raise her wages than part with her. Take my advice for once. Praise her a little more and find fault with her a little less. And if you are wise, you will leave her young man alone. And then he drank his coffee moodily. Joanna had quenched his attempt at conversation again. Joanna pondered Thorold's advice as she unraveled her skein of yarn. It was somewhat tangled, and as she pulled it with nervous jerks, the yarn snapped and the ball rolled from her hand. Thorold suppressed a forcible interjection as he groped under his chair for the ball. If ever he married, he determined that one of the first rules he would make for his wife's guidance would be that all wood winding should be done by daylight. Joanna had a tiresome habit of leaving a tangled skein for the comparative leisure of the evening hours. Thorold used to wonder sometimes if all her skeins were tangled. It got on his nerves sometimes and spoiled the enjoyment of his reading. Joanna's limp, nerveless movements, her jerky beginnings and abrupt endings, her brief spasms of energy and the inevitable hunt for the unlucky ball irritated him at times beyond endurance. It is quite ridiculous and almost derogatory to one's dignity to think how much daily life is marred by these small frets and torments. The buzzing of a blue bottle against the window pane is certainly preferable to a brass band when the instruments are cracked, but the whizzing and fizzing of the insect may in time jar on the ear, and to thin-skinned people a midge's bite is fruitful of irritation. Joanna was making up her mind slowly that her brother had given her good counsel and that perhaps it would be well for her to follow it. Thorold was the master of the house, and if he wished to keep Joanna, of course the girl must stay. And when Joanna had arrived at this point, she broke the thread of her yarn again. I thought there was something you wanted to tell me, Thorold, she said rather reproachfully, when she had found a new beginning. I had brought my work and I'm ready to talk, but you do nothing but read. Then Thorold drew down his paper impatiently. I thought you were too busy with that work he returned rather curtly, and after all it does not matter, it was only about my own business affairs. Oh, but I want to hear it, replied his sister, with much mild obstinacy. It is seldom that you do care to talk to me, Thorold. And here Joanna's voice was decidedly plaintive. I sometimes think that if it were not for finding fault with Jemima, I should almost lose the use of my voice. Thorold was fast losing patience. Joanna was in one of her most trying moods. She was at once aggressive and despondent. She was at all times very tenacious of her sisterly privileges, and nothing offended her more than being kept in the dark. Well, he might as well get it over and be done with it, but he would be as brief as possible. I only wanted to tell you that I have had a very satisfactory interview with Murdoch and Williams. Oh, indeed, and here Joanna frowned anxiously over her skein. They are solicitors, are they not? Yes, but they are very big people, Joe. I think I am likely to get the brief, you see, warming to his subject. Our last case was so satisfactory, and we got our clients such heavy damages that Murdoch and Williams were quite pleased. The junior partner made himself very pleasant, and said all kinds of civil things. And you think you will get it, Thorold? And Joanna actually laid down her skein. I shall certainly get it, and Thorold's eyes flashed with triumphs as he spoke. At such moments his face was full of expression. It will be a big case, Joe, and Sergeant Rivington will be leading counsel on our side. And then again he told himself that his foot was on the rung of the ladder, and that he had begun to climb in earnest. I am very glad, Theo, and Joanna's blue eyes were rather tearful. She and Tristram had often called him Theo, but she seldom used the old pet name now. Thorold smiled a little sadly as he heard it. 
I knew you would be pleased, dear," and his voice softened. "It will make a great difference to our income. Joa, I have made up my mind that the last of the debts shall be paid off before Christmas, and we will begin the new year free and untrammeled. There shall be an end of all your small peddling economies. We shall not be rich, but at least we need not hoard our cheese parings and candle ends." "I do not know what you mean, Thorold," returned Joanna in a puzzled tone. "We never use candles except in the coal cellar." Then Thorold gave a grim, unmirthful laugh. If he ever married, the lady of his choice should have some sense of humour. Nothing is more harassing and trying to the temper than to have to talk down to the level of one's daily companion. Althea once said, rather wittily, that Joa's brains were like a nutmeg grater. One had to rope one's nutmeg very hard before the spicy fragments would filter through it. "'Perhaps we may have a better house soon,' he said after a pause. "'I should like to be out of the town and higher up the hill.' The air is fresher, and it will be quieter. Oh, yes, much quieter, Joanna smiled, and a pretty dimple came into view. At that moment she looked almost like a girl. We must wait for our good things a little, continued Thorold. But there is no need for us to stint ourselves. And Joa, here he hesitated, why should you not smarten yourself up a bit? Get one or two new dresses, or any fallals you require for his keen, observant eyes had noticed that the old lilac silk that Joanna always wore of an evening, a relic of the old manor-house days, was faded and darned, and of obsolete fashion. He was a man who was always keenly alive to the wants and wishes of his womankind. But even as he made the suggestion, he wondered why Joanna was hoarding her five hundred pounds, and why she should not use a few pounds to replenish her scanty wardrobe. He knew, and had been very angry when he heard it, that Althea had actually presented her with a beautiful dress for church, because she said Joa was too miserly to spend the penny on herself. Joanna blushed slightly when Thorold made his good nature proposition. You are very kind, Theo, she said gently as she folded her white, nervous looking hands over her skein. But I go out so seldom that I do not require many new dresses. I have Althea's merino and, eyeing her lilac silk complacently, there is plenty of wear to be got out of my old gown yet. Well, you know best, returned Thorold indifferently. If he had stated his opinion candidly, he would have suggested that the gown in question should be relegated to Jemima or the rag bag. Well, he had done his part nobly, and now he might take up Gizzard's life. But the next moment Joanna's plaintive tones arrested him. Theo, do you remember what day this is? And as he nodded, she continued mournfully. Trist is eight and thirty today. It is actually ten years since we have seen him. Ten long years. And now a slow tear or two well down Joanna's face. What a weary time it has been. And he and Ella have never written, not a line, not a single word, since their little girl was born. He was going to Australia then, and he seemed to write in good spirits. We have his letter still, Joe. He was so pleased with his little daughter and the prospect of the new birth offered him. Yes, but that was eight or nine years ago. Oh, Thorold, why does he never write? Do you think he has ceased to care for us? No, my dear, certainly not, replied her brother kindly, for he was moved by her deep dejection. But you know how casual and happy-go-lucky the dear old chap always was. Bad habits grow stronger as we grow older. Remember that, yo. Tris never liked making little efforts. He hated writing letters, even in his school days. Probably he hates it still. And yet, for all that, he may be flourishing on some sheep farm or other. But this view of the case did not comfort Joanna, and during the rest of the evening she shed silent tears over her tangled skein. And all the time, not half a mile away, a man and a child sat hand in hand over a smoky little cindery fire, the child's shivering form wrapped in an old Inverness cape. Is it always cold in England, father? Why does not Mrs. Grimson make up a big fire? Well, you see, coals are dear a bit, and the stove is a small one. But my old coat is warm and thick. Why, you look as snug as a robin in its nest, or a squirrel in its hole, or a dormouse, or anything else you like to name. I wonder what Aunt Joa will think of my little Betty when she sees her. Then the child laughed gleefully. Shall we really find them, father? Of course we shall find them, my girlie, but we must not tire those poor little feet too much. Put them up on my knee, darling, and that will rub them and keep the chillblains away. And then as he took the tiny feet in his hand, Bet's thin little arm went round his neck. 
Oh, father, I do love you so. It makes me ache all over to love you so hard. And then Bet rested her rough, tangled head against her father's shoulder. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Molly's Prince This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouchette Carré A Check for the Black Prince Simplicity of all things is the hardest to be copied. Steel. How absolute the knave is. We must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us. Hamlet. Before many days had passed, Waveney had settled down happily at the Red House, and though she still missed Molly and had to combat frequent pangs of homesickness, her environment was so pleasant and her work so congenial that it would have seemed to her the basest ingratitude not to be thankful for her advantages. Sweet temper and high principles are important factors in a girl's happiness. Waveney knew she was walking in the path of duty, and that she had done the right thing in severing herself from the home life. A sense of independence and well-doing sweetened her daily duties, and at night, after she had prayed for her dear ones, she would sleep as calmly and peacefully as a tired child. I think Waveney is happy with us, Althea said once in a satisfied voice. And indeed, at that moment the girl's clear notes were distinctly audible, singing to herself in the corridor, as she had been accustomed to sing in the old house in Chelsea. Waveney's duties were not very irksome. When Althea's eyes troubled her, her young companion would spend the morning and the greater part of the evening reading to her or writing from her dictation and in this way Waveney gained a great deal of valuable information. "'It is a liberal education to talk to my dear Miss Althea,' she would say to Molly. "'She is so clever, and knows so much, and yet she thinks so little of herself. I believe I love and admire her more every day.' "'But you like Miss Doreen too?' observed Molly tentatively. "'Oh, yes, I am quite fond of her, and she is always as nice as possible. But she could never come up to Queen Bess.' She is more earthly and commonplace. But there, I am not expressing myself properly. Miss Althea is human, too, but she is so much more sympathetic and picturesque. But the old ladies at the home like Miss Doreen best, retorted Molly. Yes, dear, old ladies are her specialties, and girls are Miss Althea's. You would think sometimes, to hear her talk, that she was a girl herself, and knew exactly how they felt. Some of them almost worship her, and no wonder. I wish I could see her, sighed poor Molly. I love her, too, for being so good to you. For her unselfish nature knew no taint of jealousy. When Althea's eyes were in good order, Waveney merely wrote a few letters or copied some extracts neatly and then her duties in the library were over. Sometimes she would walk across to the home and read for an hour to the blind lady, Miss Elliot, or she would do little errands in the town for one or other of the sisters, Sometimes she would carry the weekly basket of flowers that Althea always sent to Joanna. But she never thoroughly enjoyed her visits. She told Molly that Miss Chater was a rather depressing sort of person. I dare say she is good and amiable, she observed. She must have virtues or Miss Althea would not be so fond of her. But she looks as though she has been out too long in a bleak wind and has got nipped and pinched. I think if she would only speak more briskly and cheerfully that she will feel better. She wants prodding somehow, like the old costermonger's donkey. And Molly laughed at this. Waveney certainly had her good times. Althea had presented her with a beautiful racket and a pair of tennis shoes. And on Thursday afternoons, she and Nora Greenwell played tennis on the new asphalt court behind the porch house. She also joined Mr. Chater's Shakespeare readings. They were to get up the Merchant of Venice next, and to her secret delight, the part of Jessica was allotted her. Mr. Chater took no special notice of her. She sat amongst the other girls, and listened to his instructions. Sometimes, when Thorold had finished some masterly declamation, he would look up suddenly from his book. Waveney's little pale face and curly head were just opposite to him. The deep, spirituelle eyes seemed glowing with golden light. Where was she? 
not in the recreation hall, but on some marble steps belonging to a dog's palace. The dark water was washing almost to her feet. Gondolas were passing and repassing in the moonlight. Grey-bearded men, in velvet doublets and ruffs, were standing in a group under the deep archway. And Portia, in her satin gown, was walking with proud and stately step, followed by her train. "'It is your turn, Miss Ward,' observed Thorold quietly. And then, as Waveney started and flushed, he bit his lip with an effort to suppress a smile. He knew, by a sort of intuitive sympathy, where her thoughts had strayed. Her absorbed attention pleased and flattered him. He began to feel interested in so promising a pupil. "'Miss Greenwell reads better,' he thought. "'But I doubt if she grasps the full meaning and beauty of a passage as Miss Ward does.' And on more than one evening the little pale face and dark, vivid eyes seemed to haunt him. Strangely enough, he had used Doreen's comparison. She is like Undine, he said to himself, and somehow the name seemed to suit her. Waveney's Sundays were always her happiest days. They were red-letter days and high festivals to her, as well as to Molly. But each time she went home she thought Molly looked lovelier and on each occasion she found relics of the Black Prince. The grapes had long ago been eaten, but a generous box of perished chocolate had replaced them, and there were always fresh hothouse flowers in the red bowl. Molly, who was becoming hardened, scarcely blushed as she pointed them out, and informed Waveney quite coolly that a hair or a brace of pheasants were hanging up in the larder. Sir Reynard at his tricks still, thought Waveney and one evening she did give her father a hint. Dad, she said a little nervously, for she felt her task a delicate one. Mr. Ingram is very kind to dear Molly. He is always bringing her things, and of course she is pleased, but I do not think he ought to come so often when she is alone. Everard started and looked at her. His little girl had plenty of penetration and sense, as he knew. No, dear, I suppose you are right, he said slowly. I will talk to Miss Molly, and she must give Mr. Ingram a hint. The little puss has encouraged him, I suppose. And then he frowned, and said a little anxiously, You don't think the fellow is making up to her, eh, Waveney? Father, dear, how can we tell? Molly is such a great baby in these sorts of things. I think she fancies that she's not grown up yet, but she is nineteen. Dad, I think he must like her a little. But he ought only to come to the house when you are at home. Won't you try and find out all about him? But Mr. Ward shook his head. He hardly knew how that was to be done. He is a gentleman, he returned rather gravely, and he is a good fellow, I am sure of that, and he has plenty of means. I like Mr. Ingram. He is a little eccentric, but he is honourable and straightforward. I would take my oath of that. Well, well, I will give Molly a good strong hint. And Mr. Ward kept his word. So a day or two later, when Mr. Ingram walked into the studio with some fresh flowers and a beautifully bound volume of Jean Ingelow's poems under his arm, that Molly had innocently remarked that she longed to read, Molly seemed hardly as pleased as usual to see him. She even turned a little pale when he presented the book with one of his joking speeches. "'Oh, thank you, you're very kind,' she stammered, fluttering the pages. "'And you have written my name in, too.' Molly spoke hurriedly and breathlessly. She had not even asked him to sit down. Mr. Ward's hint had certainly been a strong one. Mr. Ingram looked at the girl a little keenly, then he took a chair and seated himself comfortably. "'What is it, Miss Molly?' he said gently. "'You have something on your mind. Ah, oh, you cannot deceive me,' as Molly blushed and shook her head. "'I can read you like a book, and for some reason poor Monsieur Blackie is in disgrace.' "'Oh, no, no,' protested Molly, quite shocked at this. "'You could not think me so ungrateful.' "'There can be no question of gratitude between you and me,' returned the young man gravely, and he looked a little pained. Then, as Molly's sweet, wistful face seemed to plead forgiveness, he recovered himself with an effort. "'I am only troubled because I am afraid of hurting you,' she went on. "'And I am sorry, too, because I do so enjoy your visits. We know so few people, Mr. Ingram. But father said—' But here Molly utterly broke down. And why ever was Mr. Ingram looking at her in that way?' Was he angry or unhappy? You do not surely mean, Miss Molly, that your father has forbidden my visits? And now it was Mr. Ingram's turn to look pale. 
Oh, no, no, gasped Molly. How could you think of anything so dreadful? Only father would like to see you sometimes, and, uh... Then the stern look of gravity was no longer on Ingram's face. My dear Miss Molly, he said kindly, please do not distress yourself so. Let me finish that sentence for you. Your father does not in the least object to my visits, but he would like me to pay them when he is at home, and he wishes you to tell me this. Oh, yes, thank you, but how could you guess so cleverly? And Molly looked as though a world of care had rolled off her, but only an inscrutable smile answered her. Sir Oracle has spoken, he said, trying to resume his old manner. Now, Miss Molly, I may be an idealist, but I can be practical too. Will you kindly tell me on which afternoon I am likely to find your father? Only on Saturdays for certain. Very well, then. Will you tell Mr. Ward, with my compliments, that unless his house be on fire, nothing will induce me to ring his door well on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, unless by a special invitation? But on Saturday I will do myself the pleasure of calling. Is that a message to father? asked Molly, a little puzzled at his tone. But Mr. Ingram only laughed and rose from his chair. I am rather a riddle to you, am I not? he said, taking her soft little hand. And then his manner suddenly changed. Miss Molly, he continued, do you remember the first time I saw you? You were sitting in the ashes, like Cinderella. I have called you Cinderella ever since. Oh, not really, Mr. Ingram, but of course I remember the day, for I was never so startled in my life. When the door opened, I thought it was Anne, and oh dear, how frightened I was for a moment. It was like a picture, went on Ingram, and his eyes looked grave and intent. The kitchen was a little dark, but a ray of sunshine was full on your face, and you were singing. Do you remember, Miss Molly? And Molly hung her head, as though she were rather ashamed of herself. Ah, uh, yes, that old song of father's. And then rather pettishly, but I don't want to remember that. I shall never forget it. I wish I were the fairy godmother instead of Monsieur Blackie. And then there is the prince. What are we to do about the prince, Miss Molly? Oh, I don't know, murmured Molly confusedly, for Mr. Ingram's manner was rather baffling that afternoon. But how amused he would be if he knew that Waveney often called him the Black Prince. There never are princes in real life, she finished demurely. Oh, I would not be too sure of that, he returned coolly. Life is full of surprises. Why, I heard of a fellow last year. He was only a dairyman. And a rich uncle, who had made his pal in Chicago and was a millionaire, died and left him all his money. He told me in confidence that for the first month he was nearly out of his mind with worry, for he and his wife had not a notion what to do with it. I gave him a lot of advice. I told him to give his children the best education possible, and to live comfortably without trying for grandeur. And he was a sensible fellow and followed my advice. He has a good house and a model farm, and his breed of Alderney cows is the finest in the country, and I have a great respect for him and his wife, and often go and see them. Molly was much impressed with this story. She was sorry when Mr. Ingram took his leave. He had paid such a very short visit, and she knew her father's message was the cause. But he had quite recovered his spirits, for as he went downstairs, she could hear him singing to himself in a low, melodious voice. Here's to the maiden of bashful fifteen, here's to the widow of fifty, here's to the flaunting extravagant queen, here's to the housewife that's thrifty. Let the toast pass, drink to the last, I'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Waveney was far happier in her mind when she heard from Molly that Mr. Ingram's visits were always to be paid on Saturday afternoons, and even Molly owned that she preferred this. "'You see, Wave,' she explained, "'it is a little awkward entertaining Mr. Ingram all by myself. If I were like you, I should not mind it so much. But I never can talk properly, and he's so dreadfully clever. Well, he has travelled and seen the world, but he is not clever like Mr. Chater, Molly.' That man is a perfect well of knowledge. But this comparison did not seem to please Molly. I think Mr. Ingram clever, she persisted, and so does father. He said last evening that he was a thoroughly well-informed man. Oh, Wave, well, I forgot to tell you something. I asked him yesterday how long he meant to stay in Chelsea, and he looked quite surprised at the question. He said he had not been staying there for weeks, and that he was at his digging as usual. 
but that he generally spent a night or two in town every week. "'When I am up in town, I always sleep at my club,' he said. "'Now, Waveney, is it not odd that he has never told us where he lives? "'And I did not like to ask him.' "'And Waveney assented to this. "'The following Sunday, when Waveney went home, "'she found Molly in a state of great excitement. "'It was a cold November afternoon, "'and a dull moisture seemed to pervade everything. "'The pavements were wet and greasy, "'the horses' coats steamed, "'and the raw dampness was singularly penetrating. "'As the two girls hurried along, arm in arm, Molly poured out her story breathlessly. Oh, Wave, you will never guess. Such a wonderful thing is going to happen. Mr. Ingram has got a box at St. James Theatre for Wednesday for Alma's dream, and he has actually invited Father and Noel and me, and Father says we may go. Elmer's dream, returned Waveney. I heard Mr. Chater talking about that to Miss Althea. He told her that she and Miss Doreen ought certainly to see it that Miss Leslie's representation of the crazed Lady Almer was the most perfect piece of acting, and Mr. Sargent and Sir Reginald Almer was almost as fine. "'Yes, I dare say,' interrupted Molly impatiently, for she had no wish to discuss the merits of the play beforehand. "'But do listen to me, Wave, dear. Mr. Ingram will fetch us in a carriage, and he has promised to go early, so that I may see the curtain draw up. I shall wear my white dress. But what am I to do for a nice wrap?' Molly's voice was a little troubled, and for the moment Waveney did not answer. She realized at once the difficulty of the situation. "'I shall not draw my salary until Christmas,' she said presently. "'That will be a month hence, and we must not ask Father for any money.' "'No, certainly not.' "'Well, then, we must just make the best of it,' went on Waveney. "'Your black jacket is impossible, and so is your waterproof. "'So there only remains tits all red rag of a shawl.' a title they had borrowed from a charming tale they had read in their childhood. "'Oh, Waveney, dear, mother's old red shawl!' And Molly's voice was decidedly depressed. "'What will Mr. Ingram say?' "'He will say, at least he will think, that you look sweet. "'How could he help it, darling? "'Mother's shawl is warm, and in the gaslight it won't look so very shabby. "'You can throw it off directly you get into the box. "'Father must buy you some new gloves, "'and with a few flowers you will do as well as possible.' But though Molly tried to take this cheerful view of the case, she did not quite succeed, and Tit's old rag of a shawl lay heavily upon her mind. End of section 19「That's Little Betty」「We have seen better days」「Romeo and Juliet」「Her little face like a walnut shell with wrinkling lines » Henley On Monday morning, when Waveney went into the library, Althea would always ask a kindly question or two about the previous evening, to which Waveney would gladly respond. But when the girl told her with sparkling eyes about Molly's promised treat and Mr. Ingram's kindness, she looked extremely surprised and not a little amused. Doreen, who had followed them into the room and was hunting through the bookshelves for a volume she needed, turned with an exclamation. But Althea put her finger on her lip with a warning gesture. Alma's dream! Why, that is the very play that Thorold is so anxious for us to see, she observed calmly. Why should we not have a box too? You are driving into town this afternoon, Dory, and you can easily go to St. James. It will be a treat for Waveney, and you know we always intended to go. Yes, but not on Wednesday, returned Doreen in a doubtful tone. But again Althea looked at her meaningly. As for Waveney, she was speechless with delight. Althea sent her into the dining room the next moment to fetch the times, and Doreen took instant advantage of her absence. Althea, are you serious? Do you really wish me to take a box for Wednesday? Oh, yes, returned Althea, flushing a little but there was a mischievous smile on her lips. I am quite serious. Moritz is masquerading, and I want to find out his little game. My lord is too busy to call on his old friends, but I will be even with them. Hush, here the child comes story. We will have a nice little drama of our own on Wednesday. I long to see Prissy Molly and that lad of pets, Noel, and it will be a grand opportunity. Then, as Waveney returned with the paper, Doreen contented herself with a disapproving shake of the head. 
Althea was very impulsive, she thought, when she at last left the room. It was all very well to talk about Moritz, but she feared that she was putting herself in an awkward situation. Everard Ward would be there as well as Molly and Noel, and they could hardly leave the theatre without speaking to him. But all made as she was, the idea of hinting this to Althea made her feel hot all over. Althea would only laugh at me and pretend not to understand, she said to herself. And if she makes a plan, nothing will induce her to give it up. In truth, Althea was quite enamoured of her little scheme. Now, Waveney, she said in a mysterious voice, you are not to say one syllable to Molly, mind that. Is it to be a surprise? asked Waveney, opening her eyes as widely as the wolf in the red riding hood. Why, of course it is. We will all remain snugly hidden at the back of our box until the curtain draws up. And then they will be too absorbed to notice us. Think how delightful it will be to see Molly's start of astonishment when at last she catches sight of you. Oh, what fun it will be, exclaimed the girl joyfully. Yes, yes, it'll be far better not to tell Molly. But I hope she would not call out when she sees me. Monsieur Blackie, too, and Father and Noel. Oh, Miss Althea, how glorious it will be. There, I am forgetting your letters, and you wanted them written for the early post. But Althea only smiled indulgently. Waveney could settle to nothing properly that day. She had only been to the theatre twice in her life, and then only in the gallery. But to be in a box! Well, her excitement was so great that she took a long walk over the common to calm herself. Presently, an unwelcome thought obtruded itself. Her white frock was losing its freshness with constant wear, but there was no possibility of buying a new one until Christmas, and she had no suitable wrap, not even teeth all red rag of a shawl. For a moment she was full of dismay. Then, with her usual good sense, she determined to confide the difficulty to Miss Althea. She found her opportunity that very evening. Althea listened to her attentively. My dear child, she said very kindly, when Waveney had finished. Do you know, the same thought occurred to me, but there is no need to trouble yourself. I have two or three evening cloaks that Peachy will not let me wear because she says they do not suit me, and of course you can have one. Oh yes, there is a blue plush one that will just do. And Waveney thanked her delightedly. There was nothing now to mar her enjoyment or to damp her anticipation. And the next morning a letter from Molly gave her fresh pleasure. Oh, Wave, darling, it began. It is so late, and Father says I ought to be in bed, but I must write and tell you about such a wonderful thing that has just happened. I was mixing Father's salad for supper and thinking how he would enjoy it with the cold pheasant when the doorbell rang and the next minute Anne brought in a big box, one of those cardboard boxes that always looks so tempting. It was from Marshall and Snellgrove, she said, and there was nothing to pay, and there was my name, Miss Molly Ward, written as plainly as possible. Oh dear, how excited I was! But father would not let me cut the string, and he was such a time fumbling over the knots, and all the while he was laughing at me and calling me an excitable little goose. There were layers and layers of tissue paper, and then, oh, wave, dear, never, never in our lives have we seen such a cloak. I was almost afraid even to touch it. Father was right when he said rather gravely that it was more fit for one of the young princesses of Wales than for his daughter. But I must try to describe it. It is a rich ivory silk, with a lovely pattern running through it that looks like silver, and it is so warm and soft, and lined with the faintest and most delicate pink like the palm of a baby's hand. That was father's idea. And all round is the most exquisite feather trimming. And when I put it on, father said I looked like a white pigeon in its nest. Oh, Wave, do you think that our good little Monsieur Blackie sent it? There was no name, no clue of any kind. What am I to do? Ought I to thank him for it? But there was no one else who would do such a kind thing. And yet if he did not send it, how awkward that would be. You must think it over and help me, darling. Your loving but distracted Molly. Waveney did not long delay her answer. I am delighted about the cloak, sweetheart, she wrote, and he is the very prince of black princes to make my sweet mole so happy. And now mother's old red shawl can go back into the setter box. Why, of course it is, Monsieur Blackie. Do you suppose any other person would do such a delightfully unconventional thing? It is like a fairy story. It is Cinderella in real life. The pumpkin coach and all. But Molly, take my word for it, he will never own it. Perhaps if you get an opportunity, you might tell him that you had been much mystified by receiving a beautiful present anonymously, 
and that you greatly desire to thank the kind donor, and then you will see what he says. Oh, he is a deep one, Sir Reynard, and I should not be surprised if he professes entire ignorance on the subject. If I could only peep at you on Wednesday. Oh, had I but Aladdin's lamp, if only for a day. I have been singing that ever since I read your letter. And then Waveney closed her note abruptly, for fear she should say too much. But some subtle feeling of delicacy prevented her from telling Althea. That the cloak was Mr. Ingram's gift she never doubted for a moment. But though she had written jokingly to Molly, and called him the very prince of black princes, in reality she was secretly dismayed. If he loves her, why does he not tell her so? thought the girl anxiously. Instead of showering gifts on her in this oriental fashion, is it because Molly is so unconscious and that she will not see? And this is his way of winning her. Mr. Ingram does nothing like other men. He is an idealist, as he says. He is good and kind, but he is not good enough for my Molly. She is worth a king's ransom. She is the dearest and the loveliest and the best. And here Waveney broke down and shed a few tears, for her heart felt full to overflowing with mingled pride and pain. Waveney had some errands to do in the town that afternoon, and amongst other things she had to take the usual basket of flowers to Miss Chater. Waveney never cared for these visits. She liked Mr. Chater. He interested her more than any man she had ever seen. But his sister bored her. She told Molly once that she was as soft and damping as a November mist. She found her this afternoon in one of her most depressing moods. She had been having an argument with Jemima, and as usual had retired baffled from the contest. Jemima was a clever girl, and had long ago taken her mistress's measure, and she had an invariable resource on these occasions. If I don't suit you, ma'am, I can leave this day month, she would say crushingly, and then Joanna would hurriedly reply, Please don't talk nonsense, Jemima. You suit me very well. But all the same, you had no right to stand talking to the milkman for a quarter of an hour. Well, ten minutes, then, as Jemima with some heat protested against this. And I will thank you to be more careful for the future. Waveney heard the whole history of Jemima's misdemeanors. Joanna had taken a fancy to the girl, and often mentioned her to her brother. She has such a pretty manner, and she is bright and sympathetic. She is just the person for Althea. And Thorold had assented to this. Joanna wanted her to stay to tea, but Waveney had had an excuse ready. She was only too glad to get out of the house. Her own vitality was so strong, and the interest of her own personality so absorbing, that she could not understand how any human existence could be so meagre and colourless as Miss Chater's seemed to be. Is it because she's an old maid, thought the girl, as she walked over the bridge. If Molly or I did not marry, should we ever be like that? And then she added piously, Heaven forbid! What was it Miss Althea had said that first Sunday morning as they walked through the village? That it always made her angry when people talked of empty, blighted or disappointed lives, and that it was their own fault if they did not find interests. I wondered at the time what Miss Althea could mean, she said to herself. It sounded a little hard, but I have thought it out since. We must fertilize and enrich our lives properly, and not let them lie fallow too long. There is no need that any life should be thin and weedy. I suppose Miss Chater has had her troubles. But she is not without her blessings too. I dare say her brother is very good to her. Oh yes, certainly Miss Chater has her compensations. Waveney had finished all her errands, but she meant to take a turn on the embankment. The grey November afternoon had a certain charm for her. It was not at all cold, and she wanted to sit down for a few minutes and watch the barges being tugged slowly against the tide. How mysterious they looked, emerging from the dark arches of the bridge. Already they were lighting the gas, and bright flickers were perceptible across the river. A faint wind was flapping the brown and tawny sails of some vessels that were waiting to be unladen. They reminded her of the tattered pennants in the chapel at Chelsea Hospital, and then she thought sadly of the dear old surgeon. He had died peacefully in his sleep about a week after her visit, and his last conscious words had been about Sheila. Molly had seen the corporal two or three times, and one Sunday she and Waveney had gone over to the hospital. The little corporal had looked aged and dwindled, but at the sight of Waveney he had brightened. "'Ah, he is gone,' he said, in a subdued voice. 
McGill is gone, and I am fairly lost without him. Ah, he was a grand man for argufying, and would stick to his guns finely. For it stands to reason, says I, that a man with two eyes can see farther than a blind one. Not that McGill was blind then. And I'll take my oath that there were only two of those darned black niggers. And then how he would speechify and bluster, and there would be a ring round us in no time. And go it, McGill, and up at him, corporal. Oh, those were grand times, but the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And here Corporal Marx bared his grey head. And must you be going, Miss Ward? Well, good-bye, and God bless you. And now the slow tears of age were coursing down the corporal's wrinkled face. Aye, John Adap frets sorely after his old comrade, remarked Nurse Marx, when Waveney told her about her interview with the corporal. What is it we are told, my lamb? One taken and the other left. And it stands to reason that the world is a poorer place for him. Waveney was thinking about her old friends as she seated herself on a bench overlooking the river. At the farther corner a little girl was sitting, but there was no one else in sight. Waveney was fond of children, so she smiled and nodded to the child in quite a friendly way. "'You must not sit long, or you will take cold, my dear,' she said. "'Oh, I am always cold,' returned the child in a plaintive little voice. "'And I am tired, too, for I have got two bones in my legs, and they do ache so.' Waveney looked at her curiously. She was not a pretty child. Indeed, it was rather a singular little face, with oddly pronounced features. She had pathetic-looking eyes and fair hair, which she wore in a long plait, and in spite of her shabby dress and worn boots, her voice was refined and sweet. When she made her little speech, she settled up to Waveney in the most confiding way. "'Do you have bones in your legs, too? But you are one of the grown-ups. Grown-ups don't mind being tired. Daddy says when my legs grow longer they will leave off aching.' and I suppose Daddy knows. Poor might, thought Waveney pityingly, and then she said kindly, Are you alone, little one? Is your home near? But the child shook her head. Daddy and I have not got any home, she returned wearily. There aren't any homes in England, are there? We live with Mrs. Grimson in Chapel Road. I think she is a good woman, she continued gravely in her old-fashioned way. She bathed my feet so nicely when I got wet. "'But I don't like her rooms. "'They are not like my own dear home.' "'Where was your home, my dear?' asked Waveney, "'taking the little cold hand in hers. "'But the child hesitated. "'We had many homes, but they were all across the sea, "'a long, long way off. "'We came in a big ship with such a nice captain. "'Daddy's gone to Hamertown to look for Aunt Joa, "'and Mrs. Grimson's Susan left me here. "'I never knew before that grown-ups could be lost, "'but we have been looking for Aunt Joa, till I have got the aches in my legs, and we have not found her yet. This was rather puzzling to Waveney, but she was one of those motherly girls who knew by instinct how to win a child's heart, so she only cuddled the cold little hands comfortably, and asked her if she had a pretty name. Then the little girl smiled, showing a row of white pearly teeth as she did so. Dad and I think it nice, she returned, nodding her head, but it is very short. Daddy says I am too small to have a big name. I am Betsy with an important air. That's little Betty. But Dad does always call me Bet. Is your name long or short? Waveney was about to answer this friendly question when a man's voice behind them made her start. Why, Bet, it said, why are you perched up here like a lost robin? And Susan has been looking for you half over the place. It's my daddy, it's my dear dad, cried the child joyously, and the next moment she was running to meet a tall man who was walking quickly toward them. Waveney watched the meeting. She saw the man stoop and kiss the little one fondly, and then Bet took hold of his rough coat and drew him toward the seat. Susan was naughty, Dad. She did tell me to sit there, and she would fetch me, and she did never come at all, but this young lady was very kind, so I did not cry. That's my brave little Bet, and then the man took off his hat to Waveney. Thank you very much, he said heartily. I was obliged to leave my little girl, and I am afraid they neglected her. Waveney felt vaguely perplexed. The man's face, and even his voice, seemed strangely familiar to her, and yet she was sure she had never seen him before. He was a handsome man, though his face looked weather-beaten and somewhat worn. His clothes were rough and shabby, but his voice was unmistakably cultured. He had evidently seen better days. "'Susan is not always naughty,' observed Bessie. "'She gave me a peppermint once, and it was very nice.' 
"Dad, dear, did you find Aunt Joa?" Then the man shook his head in rather a depressed way. "No, Bet, and we are still down on our luck. There is no such name at Hamerton. Perhaps this lady may know it." And then he looked a little eagerly at Waveney. "I am a stranger in these parts. Can you tell me if any one of the name of Chaytor lives at Dereham?" "Why, yes," returned Waveney, surprised by the question. "Miss Chaytor and her brother live in High Street." "And the names the Christian names, I mean?" asked the stranger hoarsely. "Mr. Chaytor's name is Thorold," returned Waveney simply, "and his sister is Joanna." Then the man snatched up the child in his arms. He seemed almost beside himself. "Thank God we have found them, pet, my dear old Theo and Joa." Oh, what a fool I have been, going so far afield, and all the time they were actually at Durham. And then he sat down, and a few words cleared up the mystery. About an hour later, as Joanna was drawing the crimson curtains over the window, Jemima threw open the door with a little fling. There is a child outside wanting to speak to you, ma'am. I would not let her into the passage, because she might have come to beg, but she said she wanted Miss Chater most particular. Very well, Jemima, I will go and speak to her and Joanna, who was very tender-hearted and never turned away a tramp on fed, went quickly to the door. A little girl, a tiny creature, was standing there. She looked up in Joanna's face wistfully. "'Oh, please will you tell me if you are Miss Chater, Miss Joanna Chater,' correcting herself with careful pronunciation. "'That is my name, certainly,' returned Joanna, rather surprised at this. "'And what do you want with me, my little girl?' "'Oh, please, Aunt Joa,' returned the child. I am Betty, that's little Betty, and Daddy is at the gate. And then the next moment, a man's shadow was distinctly visible. End of chapter 20、Chapter、21 of Molly's Prince This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouche Carey. Chapter 21. A Child's Creed. I was born, sir, when the crab was ascending and my affairs go backwards. Congreve. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Wordsworth. Thorold Chater was not an imaginative man. He was neither emotional nor impressionable, and more than once lately he had puzzled himself over the singular persistency with which his long-lost brother Tristram haunted him. For the last two or three years he had hardly thought of him, but now, as he crossed the bridge of an evening, little tricks of speech and long-forgotten scenes would recur to his memory, but he never spoke of this to Joanna. "'Poor old Trist, I hope nothing has happened to him,' he said to himself one evening, when the impression of his brother's presence had been so unusually strong that the familiar face had seemed as though it had been limbed against the darkness. And then he thought sadly, and shuddered at the thought how it was a well-known psychological fact that people at the point of death had often appeared, or rather seemed to appear, to some relative or friend. Of course, it is only animal magnetism, the transmission of thought, the influence of one mind over another, he thought, a strong wave-beat of sympathy, but I should not have thought that I was the man for that sort of experience. And then he put this latch-key into the door and let himself in. As he hung up his hat on its accustomed peg, he was aware of an unusual silence in the house. The parlor door was not opened, and there was no Joanna. With her irritating question, Is that you, Thorold? Neither did he hear her soft, gliding footsteps overhead. Perhaps she has gone to the red house after all, he said to himself, and the thought of an evening of blissful solitude pleased him well. But as he entered the sitting-room, he started. There were no preparations for the evening meal, the tea-things were still on the table, and, to his intense surprise, a child, actually a child, 
was fast asleep on the couch by the fire. Thorold crossed the room softly and contemplated the little stranger with puzzled eyes. It must be one of Joa's waifs and strays, he thought, for he was aware of his sister's charitable propensities, and yet she hardly looked like a tramp's child. Very likely the poor little thing has lost her way, and Joa is taking her in for the night, he continued. Poor child, she seems tired out. And then his eyes softened, as he noticed how carefully Joanna had wrapped her up in her old fur cloak. The next moment he heard his sister's footsteps on the stairs, and went out into the passage to question her. But when he saw her face, he was struck dumb with astonishment. Joanna was looking radiant. She was dimpling and smiling like the girl Joa of old, and her blue eyes were shining through happy tears. "'Oh, Thorold, why are you so late? We have wanted you so!' And Joanna's thin white hands grasped him almost convulsively. "'Who is that child?' he whispered loudly. "'Is it someone you have found in the street?' Then, in her excitement, she gave him a hysterical little push. "'You have seen her. Oh, Thorold, is she not like him? His little Betty, my darling Tristram's little Betty!' And as he stared at her, and turned pale, for a sudden prevision of the truth had come to him, she sobbed out, "'Yes, yes, Tristram has come. He is upstairs. He is in your room, Thorold. Go to him, dear, while I get your supper ready.' And then Thorold drew a long breath and darted upstairs, and Joanna, crying softly out of sheer bliss and gratitude, busied herself in womanly ministrations. Thorold was thankful to meet his brother alone. In spite of his reserve, he was a man of deep feelings, and when he felt Tristram's mighty grasp of his hand, and heard his familiar voice say in broken accents, "'Theo, dear old fellow, dear old chap!' He was almost too moved to speak. "'Why have you not written to us all these years?' were his first coherent words, but Tristram shook his head. He had no excuse to offer. He had drifted from place to place, seeking work and not always finding it, and he did not wish his friends to know how hardly things had gone with him. "'I was always a proud beggar, Thorold,' he said with a sigh. "'But my back is pretty well broken now, and there's Bet, you see. "'And Ella, where is your wife, Trist?' "'Then Tristram turned his head aside. "'Ella is dead. I buried her two years ago,' he returned sadly. "'Poor dear Ella, she never had her good things in this life.' You have taken me for better or for worse, but there has been no better in it at all, I often said to her, but she never liked me to say it. Ah, she was the best wife a man could have, but she lies in the cemetery at Melbourne, and little Theo lies with her. I caught him after you, old chap, but he never got over the fever. I think it was the loss of the boy that finished Ella for she never seemed to hold her head up again. Tristram evidently felt his wife's death acutely, and Thorold, with quiet tact, said a word or two of sympathy, and then changed the subject. Before their brief talk was over, and they went downstairs to join Joanna, Thorold found out that Tristram was utterly unchanged. The handsome ne'er-do-well, as Althea used to call him, was only a little older and perhaps a trifle rougher, but he was the same irresponsible, happy-go-lucky, easy-tempered Tristram of old. Shiftless and indolent, he had drifted wherever the tide of circumstance had carried him. Sometimes he had worked, and at other times he had starved. But when any good Samaritan stretched out a helping hand and drew him out from the slough of despond, he would pull himself together and go on gaily, as though the sun of prosperity had always shone on him. 
never were there two brothers so widely dissimilar but tristram was no evil living prodigal no black sheep to be dreaded and shunned by all right-minded people he had loved his wife and had treated her well and the poor woman had repaid him with the truest devotion and now his sister had received him with tears of joy his sins were the sins of a weak nature a nature that disliked effort and chose the softest paths for itself which landed him in strange places sometimes i have made an awful muddle of my life he said when thorold questioned him with kindly interest don't you recollect the dear old governor saying something of the kind on his deathbed upon my word old chap i think i am the unluckiest beggar that ever walked this earth nothing prospers with me if i make a little money i somehow contrive to lose it i am pretty nearly at the end of my tether i can tell you that what made you leave melbourne asked thorold in his calm judicial way then tristram shrugged his shoulders and seemed unwilling to answer the question well i was a fool he returned presently and he pulled his rough moustache a little fiercely the biggest fool out if you will but i got into a regular panic there were two of them lying there and bet was seedy and i got it into my head that the climate of melbourne did not suit her and then i thought what a fine thing it would be if joa could look after her a bit a child wants a woman's care and as i smoked my pipe that evening i had such a fit of homesickness that i was nearly crazy i had a bit of money put by and i took our berths the next day and here we are old chap and you must just make the best of us and tristan brought down his hand heavily on his brother's shoulder they went downstairs after this and found betty awake and sitting on her aunt's lap the little one was chattering happily to her and joanna was fondly stroking the plait of fair hair so he says to me you are dad's betty are you my little miss and i said yes of course mr captain that is what daddy does always call me and he laughed in his beard oh such a great laugh why bet you chatterbox are you talking about your friend the captain exclaimed tristram come here you monkey and speak to uncle theo and betty came with ready obedience i am very glad to see you uncle theo she said gravely slipping her little hand into his and thorold stooped down and kissed her cheek then a little awkwardly he lifted her on his knee and scrutinized the childish features bet's blue eyes opened rather widely she was vaguely alarmed by her new uncle's solemnity daddy she said after a few minutes silent endurance does not uncle theo like me he do stare so and he has such big eyes for even to wee betty the noticeable man with large grey eyes was a formidable being at close quarters they all laughed at this and thorold kissed her again and told her to run to aunt joa and she would make her more comfortable but to his astonishment bet refused to leave her nature was a curiously sensitive one and she had got it into her small mind that her plain speaking had hurt him and that she must somehow make it up with him i don't mind big eyes if they are nice ones she said graciously and yours are pretty nice uncle theo bet was rather aggrieved when her flattering speech was received with fresh mirth she was not so sure after that that she did not like aunt joa much the best when supper was over bet went to bed joanna had refused to part with her and had carried her off to her own room to the jaded disappointed woman the sight of bet kneeling beside the bedside and saying her simple prayers was very sweet and touching god bless dear daddy and my own dear mammy and dear little brother theo and uncle theo and aunt joa too for ever and ever amen bet darling whispered joanna 
pressing the little white-gowned figure tenderly in her arms. "'Did father teach you those prayers?' "'Yes, he did teach me,' returned Bet, sleepily. And then she roused up. "'There was an old woman once, Aunt Joa. She was a silly old woman, and she did say to Dad, "'Why do you let that baby pray for her mother? I am quite shocked.' and dad he did say i am sorry ma'am that you should be shocked but i don't think the angels are a bit offended because my little girl asks god to bless one of the dearest of mothers oh i did laugh i was so pleased when dad said that when joanna went downstairs she found the two brothers talking over the fire she sat down beside tristram but on this evening there was no tangled skein in her hands. They were folded placidly in her lap. It was occupation enough for her to look at Tristram's brown, weather-beaten face and to listen to his voice. Now and then he looked at her with a kind smile. "'Trist, do you know that Thorold has nearly paid off father's debts?' she said, presently. Then Tristram regarded his brother almost with awe. "'Oh, you always were a fine fellow, Theo,' he said enviously. "'You are the good elder brother, you know, and I am the prodigal.' Here he sighed heavily. "'Well, I am weary of my husks. I want to turn over a new leaf and settle down. You will find me some work, old chap, and I'll stick to it like a Trojan. I give you my word I will.' "'Work is not so easy to find.' returned thorold quietly but i will do what i can to help you i am pretty busy myself for i have to get up an important case we will talk about ways and means to-morrow yes and i must be going to my diggings now or mother grimsom will think i am lost she's a decent body mother grimsom and has been very good to my bet as tristram rose from his chair joanna caught hold of his arm "'Wait a moment, Trist. I want to ask Thorold something before you go. "'Why should not Trist and Betty come here, at least for a time? "'There is plenty of room, and I could look after Bet, "'and Jemima is so fond of children. "'Do have them, my dear. It will make me so happy.' "'And Joanna timidly put her hand on Thorold's arm. "'No, no,' returned Tristram, but he spoke a little hoarsely. "'You are a good creature, Joa, but I must not take advantage of your kindness. "'I have made my own bed, and it is a hard one, and I must lie on it.' "'But he looked at his brother very wistfully as he said this. "'There was no hesitation in Thorold's manner. "'Joanna is right,' he said calmly. "'You had better come to us, Trist, at least for a time, "'while you are looking for a berth to suit you.' and Tristan accepted this offer with gratitude. "'Oh, Thorold, you have made us both so happy!' exclaimed Joanna, gratefully, when Tristram had left them. "'Bet is such a darling, I could not bring myself to part with her.' But Thorold only smiled at her without speaking. When Joanna had gone up to her room, he sat down by the fire. He wanted to think over things quietly." The millstone that had been so long round his neck was slipping off, and now he must adjust his shoulders to a new burden. The wanderer had returned, and he and his helpless child were to be received under his roof. Was he glad or sorry for this? Was the burden or the joy the greater? Would his home life be gladdened or still further depressed by these new inmates? Thorold could not answer these questions. His straightforward, sincere nature only grasped the one fact. It is my duty. With all his faults and follies, he is my only brother. God do so to me and more also, if I refuse to help my own flesh and blood. Althea was very much moved when Waveney carried home the news that evening, she drove down to High Street so early the next morning that Joanna was still doing her marketing. She found Tristram sitting by the fire with Bet on his knee. 
He put down the child when he saw a stranger. "'Do you remember an old friend, Tristram?' she said, holding out her hand and looking at him kindly. Then a sudden light dawned on him. "'Is it? Can it be Althea?' he asked, and as she smiled he wrung her hand so energetically that she winced with pain. "'Oh, yes, of course I recognize you now. You are just the same, Althea. You are not a bit changed all these years. No, I have only grown older. We all do that, you know. And this is your little girl, Tristram? But she is not like you. No, Bet takes after her mother, but Ella was pretty, and Bet is not, bless her. Then Betty, who was snugly ensconced in Althea's arm, peeped out at her father with a protesting face. "'Did you want your little Bet to be pretty, Dad?' she asked, rather sadly. "'No, my pet,' he returned, laughing. "'I don't want her any different.' "'Oh, I'm glad of that,' returned the child, and then she frowned anxiously. "'You are quite sure, Dad. I could try very hard, you know. Everyone can try hard to be pretty.' And then in a low voice, "'And I could ask God to help me.' Mother always did say I might ask for anything I want, and I could just say, Dad wants his little girl to be real pretty, so please make me so forever and forever. Amen. Tristram looked at Althea with a smile. He was used to Bet's quaint speeches. He was surprised to see that Althea's eyes were full of tears. How beautiful it is, she sighed. The faith of little children— how it shames us poor worldlings. But at that moment Joanna entered the room, and Bet, with a joyful exclamation, ran to meet her. End of chapter 21For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouche Carey. Chapter 22. Between the Acts. In all the humors, whether grave or mellow, thou such a touchy, testy, pleasant fellow, hast so much wit and mirth, and spleen about thee, that there's no living with thee or without thee. Addison, Spectator The way is as plain as way to parish church, as you like it. In all London there were no two happier girls than Waveney and Molly Ward that Wednesday evening. Nevertheless, Molly's cup of bliss lacked one ingredient to make it perfect. If only Waveney were there. If she had only known that at that very moment Waveney was peeping at her from the back of the box opposite. There is my dear Molly, she whispered excitedly. Then Althea, much perplexed, swept the boxes with her opera glass. She could not see the girl anywhere but just opposite them, standing quite alone in the front of the box, there was a young lady in a white silk cloak and a pink shower bouquet in her hand, and she had the sweetest and most beautiful face that Althea had ever seen. "'What a lovely girl!' she said to herself, and she was not surprised to see that opera glasses from all parts of the house were leveled in that direction." But the next moment she started, for surely she recognized that dark, foreign-looking man who had just entered the box. Moritz, she ejaculated. Good heavens! Could that exquisite young creature be Molly Ward? And then Althea's color changed as a slight, fair man joined them, followed by a tall, aristocratic-looking youth with pince-nez. "'Father and Noel!' whispered Waveney, in a wave of 
suppressed ecstasy, but only Doreen heard her. Althea's lips were white and trembling. The lights were flickering before her eyes. The tuning up of the instruments in the orchestra sounded harsh and discordant. No, she had not expected this, to find him so unchanged. It was twenty-one years since they had met, and yet it seemed to her that it was the same Everard Ward whom she remembered so well. He even wore the same white stephanotis in his coat. He was a little older, perhaps, a trifle thinner, but it was the same perfect face. Distance and the electric light softened down defects. Althea could not see how shiny and worn Everard's dress coat was any more than she could see the lines on his forehead and round his eyes, or the threatened baldness. She only noticed that he stood in his old attitude, his head raised, and one hand lightly twirling his mustache. Althea stifled a sigh. Well, she was glad to have seen him again, very glad. When ghosts were troublesome, it was well to lay them. And then, though her woman's heart failed her, and she vaguely felt that Doreen had been wiser and more prudent than she, she determined to pluck up spirit and play her little drama to the bitter end. The curtain had now drawn up, and they were at liberty to seat themselves comfortably in the front of the box. Molly's and Waveney's eyes were fixed on the stage, but Mr. Ingram, who had seen the play before, was not so engrossed. He had just discovered a picturesque little girl in a sapphire blue cloak, and a curly, babyish-looking head who reminded him of his little Samaritan. He wanted to take another look at her, but he could only see her profile. And then Althea's long, pale face and reddish hair came into view, and beside her Doreen's dark-complexioned features. "'Now what on earth has put it into my cousin's head to come here tonight?' he said to himself, in a vexed voice. "'It is not like Althea to spoil sport in this fashion, and they have brought little Miss Ward, too.' And then he frowned and twisted his moustache fiercely, and growled under his breath, "'Confound those women!' in quite irate fashion. "'Anyone who knew Mr. Engram well, his mother, if he had one, or his sister, for there was certainly no wife on evidence, would have seen that he was greatly chagrined and perplexed. But, being a humorist, and one of the most good-natured men living, he worked off his wrath harmlessly by parodying the well-known verse, and muttering it softly for his own refreshment. Oh, woman in our hour of ease, a giddy flirt, a flippant tease, as aggravating as the shade, by blind Venetian ever made, when pain and anguish wring the brow, a veritable humbug thou. And lo and behold, he was so pleased with his own cleverness that his exasperation died a natural death. The first act was over before Molly caught sight of Waveney, and then her delight and excitement were so great that her father had to gently admonish her that they were surrounded by strangers, and Noel, in a melodramatic whisper, threatened to take strong measures unless she behaved properly and left off kissing her hand like a crazy infant. The next moment Mr. Ingram left his seat, and Althea, who guessed that he was coming across to them, went to the back of the box to receive him. He looked at her gravely. "'Et tu, brute,' he said reproachfully, as he took her hand. Althea laughed. "'Oh, I was not spying on you, my lord,' she returned playfully, but he exclaimed, "'Hush, for pity's sake!' in such an agonized tone that Althea nearly laughed again. "'That child does not hear us.' she said soothingly. Shall we take a turn in the corridor? And as he nodded assent, they went out together. Waveney had not even seen him enter the box. She was busily telegraphing to Molly. Well, Moritz, 
demanded Althea, in an amused tone. "'You may as well make a clean breast of it. "'Why have you forgotten your poor old cousins at the Red House, "'and why are you masquerading in this mysterious fashion? "'They call you Mr. Ingram, these children, "'but you are not Mr. Ingram now. "'And though I am not curious, "'oh, not the least bit in the world,' "'as he smiled provokingly, "'I should like to know what it all means.' "'What it means. Upon my word, Althea, you have asked a difficult question. One cannot always tell the meaning of things.' And then Moritz pulled his moustache in a perplexed way. "'Haven't you watched some boy throw a stone in a pond? It may be a mere pebble, but the circles widen and widen until the whole surface of the water is covered with intersecting circles?' "'Why, yes,' she returned coolly, but we are not throwing stones just now, are we? No, it was only a parable. I deal in parables sometimes. I was just flinging my little pebble for mere sport and idleness when I called myself by my old name. I wanted to be incognito, to have no gaudy tag or bobtail attached to my humdrum personality. Only, you see, the play has lasted longer than usual. But why? she persisted, but her tone was a little anxious. Moritz, please do not think me disagreeable. You were always a whimsical being, and only Gwen knows the extent of your eccentricities. But I am interested in these people. Here she caught her breath a little. When Mr. Ward knows, he might not be pleased. Oh, I will take my chance of that he returned, obstinately, but Althea had not finished all she had to say. We used to know him so well in the old days. He was constantly at Kitlands. No, I know you and Gwen never saw him there. You were living abroad those two years. But Thorold Chater knew him. I was thinking that all this masquerading might lead to awkward complications by and by. Nonsense! he returned, quickly. What makes you so faint-hearted? My dear cousin, there will be no complications at all. But Althea shook her head almost sadly. Listen to me, he went on with increased animation. It is a pretty little comedy in real life, and full of dramatic situations. I am enjoying my incognito immensely. It is the best bit of fun I have had since poor old Ralston died. In Cleveland Terrace, I am Monsieur Blackie. I adore the name. It suits me down to the ground. Then, as Althea laughed, he took hold of her arm in a coaxing fashion. Althea, you are a good creature. You must promise to keep my secret for a little while. I have made all my plans and prepared my denouement, and I shall want your help in carrying it out. No hints to Gwen. No treasonable correspondence. Gwen is a good girl, but her honesty is almost clumsy. It is yea, yea, and nay, nay, with her and Jack, too. My masquerading, as you call it, would simply shock her. Now I have promised Miss Molly to bring her sister to our box, and I must keep my word. Perhaps Moritz's voice changed as he said this, but Althea looked at him rather earnestly. "'She is beautiful as an angel,' she said in a low voice. "'Take care of yourself, Moritz.' But only a flash of his eyes answered her. Certainly Althea looked very grave when she re-entered the box. Mr. Ingram had warned Molly that there must be no stage embrace, so she had to content herself by squeezing Waveney's hand at intervals. The second act had already commenced, and until it ended there could be no conversation between the sisters. But when the curtain fell for the second time, Molly dried her eyes, for she had been shedding a deluge of tears, sniffed daintily at her flowers, and then asked Waveney, in a loud whisper, if Miss Althea had given her that pretty cloak. Waveney nodded. "'Yes, is it not sweet of her?' She says I am to keep it. But, Molly, dear, yours is almost too lovely. 
Do you know, Miss Althea would not believe you were Molly Ward, because you were so beautifully dressed. Cinderella is turned into a princess tonight. And then she put her lips to Molly's ear. Did you find out anything from the Black Prince? Yes, no, oh, please hush, returned Molly, with a distracting blush and a timid glance at Ingram. No, dear, he will not own to it, but of course I know. There, the curtain is going up again, and we shall hear if that dear girl is really dead. Molly had made her little attempt while she was waiting for her father and Noel. Mr. Ingram had come early, but Molly was already dressed and limping up and down the room, for she was far too restless to sit still. "'I have brought you some flowers,' he said, simply, as he handed her the magnificent bouquet. Then, as Molly blushed and thanked him, she carefully rehearsed the little speech that she had prepared beforehand. He was looking at her cloak, admiring it. Yes, his eyes certainly expressed decided approbation. Mr. Ingram, she stammered, for tact and finesse were not strong points with Molly. D do you know I have had a great surprise? I, I have had such a beautiful present. It came the other night, and there was no name and no address and I do so want to thank the kind friend who sent it. Mr. Ingram was arranging the flowers in his buttonhole. A leaf was awry, and he was the soul of neatness. Perhaps this was why he did not look at Molly. Dear me, he said quietly, an anonymous gift. This sounds interesting. A little mystery always enhances the value of a thing. Oh, do you think so? returned molly rather nonplussed by his tone i suppose being a girl i think differently about that i am sure that i should enjoy wearing my beautiful cloak a hundred times more if i could thank the giver there now observed ingram in a voice of supreme satisfaction i did not like to ask the question for fear you should think me inquisitive and it is really that cloak that becomes you so well that is the mysterious present. I congratulate you, Miss Molly. I do indeed, for I never saw you look better in my life. Upon my word, if I were ordering an evening cloak for Gwen, I would choose her just such another. Poor Molly, all this glib talk bewildered her, but she was far too grateful and too much in earnest to give up her point, so she only raised her lovely eyes to Ingram and said, very wistfully you could not help me to find out i do so want to know but ingram only shrugged his shoulders he even looked a trifle bored you may ask me anything else miss molly but i assure you i should make a bad detective why he continued airily i find it difficult enough to keep my own secrets without finding out other people's Oh. Here comes our friend the humorist. And now may I beg to inform you that Monsieur Blackie's carriage stops the way? Waveney did not return to her friend's box, and at the conclusion of the play they all met in the lobby. Waveney was hanging on her father's arm, but he disengaged himself hastily when he saw the sisters. Althea, who had been nerving herself for this moment all the evening, was only a little paler than usual as she held out her hand to him. "'It is a great many years since we met, Mr. Ward,' she said with a grave smile. "'Yes,' he returned, looking at her with equal gravity, but his eyes were sad. "'More than twenty years, I think.' And then he shook hands with Doreen rather stiffly, while Althea spoke to Molly and Noel. I should like you to come and see me, my dear, she said to the delighted child. Would next Tuesday suit you? Waveney shall come over in the carriage and fetch you, and perhaps your brother would join you and take you back in the evening. And Molly accepted this invitation with great readiness. Everard, who had overheard this, came a step nearer. 
I must take this opportunity of thanking you for your kindness to my dear child, he said, with strong feeling in his voice. It was hard to part with her, but you make her so happy that Molly and I try to be resigned to her loss. You do not owe me any thanks, returned Althea, her lips paling with evident emotion, for we love her for her own sake, and she is a great comfort to me. Ah, I see my cousin is beckoning to you, so I will wish you good night. Everard shook hands with her rather absently, but a moment later he came back to her side. Miss Harford, pardon me, but did you say, just now, that Ingram was your cousin? Then Althea looked a trifle confused. How incautious she had been. Yes, she returned guardedly. Moritz is certainly our cousin, once removed. When we were at Kitlands, his father, Colonel Ingram, lived abroad, so that is why you never met him. Did you not ever hear us speak of Moritz and Gwendolen? I think not. I am sure not. But Everard's eyes were downcast as he spoke. Then, without another word, he lifted his hat and turned away. The mention of Kitlands had been like a stab. Even Althea hardly guessed how this meeting had tried him, and how cruelly his pride had suffered. Althea was very silent all the way home. She was tired, she said, and Doreen and Waveney must discuss the play without her. But as she leant back in her corner of the carriage, very little of the conversation reached her ears. Ah, she had noted the changes now, the shiny dress coat, the lines, the slight baldness, had all been apparent under the flaring gaslights in the lobby. She could see now that Everard was aged and altered. The spring and brightness of youth had gone, and care and disappointment and ceaseless drudgery had given him the stoop of age. Already his shoulders seemed bowed, as though some heavy load lay on them. But the face grave and careworn as it was, was the face of her old lover. The features were as finely chiseled as ever. No sorrow, no failure, no wearing sense of humiliation would ever rob Everard Ward of his man's beauty, though perhaps an artist would no longer desire to paint him as ethereal. I am glad to have seen him again, thought Althea, but a dry sob rose in her throat as she said it. How coldly, how gravely he had accosted her. He had expressed no pleasure in meeting his old friends, had asked no single question about their welfare, a few stiff words of thanks for her kindness to Waveney, but nothing more, nothing more. And Althea's eyes grew misty with unshed tears in the darkness. There were some lines by Miss Murdoch that Everard had once written in her album. She had read them so often she knew them by heart. They were haunting her now. Forgotten. No, we never do forget. We let the years go, wash them clean with tears. Leave them to bleach out in the open day, or lock them careful by, like dead friends' clothes till we shall dare unfold them without pain. But we forget not, never can forget. It is my nature to be faithful, Althea had once touchingly said to her sister, and to forget was certainly not possible to her. End of chapter 22